Today we'll have our last talk about type systems. Recall that we originally wrote down functions with the form lambda x e, and then we had to change that to lambda x t e because we had to be able to support knowing what the type of an argument was when we did the type version. And we also made this one lambda f of x dot e to add recursion, but to have recursion in the type system, we have to add a type for the return value and a type for the argument. We refer to these components right here, these extra annotations, so type annotations. We refer to these type annotations as the type tax because it's something that is not part of the computational content of our program, but it is something that we're required to write because of our use of the type system. And this is something that irks a lot of programmers, having to write these things down. What we'll do today is we'll talk about how to um, allow your type system to figure out what annotation should be put there, uh, or rather you would have put there had you been able to. So this topic is broadly called type inference. Now one thing that's really important to understand is this has nothing to do with so-called dynamic typing. Type inference is not what languages like JavaScript, Python, Ruby, etc. do. There's nothing like that at all. Type inference is what languages like Haskell and ML and what C++'s auto does. Okay, so let's elaborate on what exactly that is. So let's talk about it from the from the perspective of C++. Imagine I write this program int x equals 5, and then I write um, return x plus 2. Now, notice that this right here and this right here both tell me x is a number. Because we know that 5 is a number, and we know that you can only do plusing to numbers, so wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to write that and I could somehow see that it's a 5 and see that it's used as a plus to know that it's a number? Well, in modern C++, we could write auto x equals 5 and then that'll just work out. Similarly, if there were another function out there in the world, like this, that took in an integer, then if I were to have write auto x equals f of 2, then it's going to know that that's integer because it says right there that it's integer. These are examples of type inference. What we do is we use the program to figure out what types variables should have. Or maybe a better way to think about it is what types they do have. Because if we look at the program and we just run it, well, it turns out that x only ever actually contains a number. So therefore, we're going to discover that it's always a number. And then we don't have to write the annotation because we can discover that ourselves. Um, now, this is very similar to when you are solving. So this is similar to solving a system of equations, to solving a system of equations. For example, suppose I wrote down x plus y equals 10, and I wrote down that 4y equals 20. Well, this right here is a system of equations that does not say exactly what x and y is. But from this system of equations, we can figure out what x and y is. Because what we can do is we can rewrite this bottom equation right here into y equals 5. Then we'll have x plus y equals 10. 
Then we can take this y and substitute it right there and get x plus 5 equals 10 and y equals 5. And then we can subtract 5 from both sides here and learn that x equals y equals 5. So notice that this right here, this system of equations, has enough information to determine that x and y are equal to 5, but that information is latent. We don't know it yet without studying the system of equations. Similarly, if we were to look at this program right here, it actually has enough information to know that x is an integer, so that we need to, you know, crunch a few numbers to figure that out. Okay, so that's kind of the intuition that we're going to have. Just as an aside, um, notice that with a system of equations, sometimes we can have something that doesn't make sense. For instance, we might say 2y equals 15. Well, there's no solution to this system of equations right here because it can't be, it's not possible for y to simultaneously be 5 and for it to be uh, 7.5. So likewise, it's possible to write programs that use variables inconsistently. For instance, we could write down auto x equals 5, and then we could write down printf x 2. And now this doesn't make sense because this right here says x is a string, and this right here says x is a number, and those things are not compatible with one another. So we can make a program where the system of equations that describe the types make it so it's not possible to, um, to actually assign every variable a single type that still makes sense. So such a program would be inconsistent or untyped. Okay. Now, it's also the case that we can write down programs that are under constrained. So for instance, I can write x plus y equals 10 and 4y equals 20. And then I can write down that, um, that uh, I don't know, maybe I can write down y plus, actually, let's, not, let's do that. And then maybe I'll write down, ah, here's what I'll do. I'll say y plus x plus z plus x plus y equals 10. So this system of equations, the simplest way that we could write it would be that x plus z equals 5 and y equals 5. So, because of that, we don't, um, it's not possible for us to uh, come up with a single assignment of x and y. There are actually many, many possible answers uh, to what x and y could be. This would be an under-constrained, by the way, inconsistent is also called over-constrained. This would be an under-constrained system. Okay. Or you might say that this is like a polymorphic program. For instance, if we wrote a program like this, we could say auto x equals 5. And then we could say that auto y. And then we could say return x plus 2. Notice that since we don't use y, it could be any type. Now, that's kind of a boring example of something that uh, is unconstrained. We'll look at more interesting examples of something unconstrained later. Okay, so that's kind of a brief overview of what we're going to do. So the next step is to set up how this theory is going to work. So here's how our, here's how our system is going to work. We're going to make a special type system. So we're going to make a type judgment that returns two things. First, it returns a type. And second, it returns a set of constraints. These constraints say, uh, you know, uh, they're like the system of equations. Next, we'll write a solution algorithm. We'll write an algorithm, an algorithm 
for solving such systems. Okay, so here we'll look at an example. So imagine we had a program E, and we're going to use our type system, and it's going to spit out two things. It's going to spit out a type, like normal, but then it has to have another thing, so we're just going to use some notation. We're going to put a comma, and we're going to say what else it spits out. And we're going to say that it also spits out, um, uh, it also spits out some constraints. And actually, there's one more thing, third. Uh, a list of variables, a list of variables, really a set, a set of variables used in the constraints. So let's look at a little example of that. So imagine that we had a program, um, well, let's just leave the program blank for a moment. So we have some program, and we're going to say its type is x. Then the constraints are going to say that, um, that uh, that number arrow x equals number arrow number and y equals z and z equals number and then there's going to be some variables and it's going to say x, y, and z and z are variables. So this is an example it says that the type is x and here's a system of equations that says that number arrow x equals number arrow number, y equals z, and z equals number. And then the variables are x, y, and z. So we're going to take this set of constraints and we're going to solve it and we're going to discover that x is supposed to be number. Does that make sense? All right. So here's the way it's going to work. Let's have a really simple system. So e is either going to be a very oh, sorry a value, a variable, an application, an if. Okay, those are the possibilities, and values are either going to be lambdas, and notice that they're going to have no annotation, or they're going to be constants, and then there's going to be a function called big delta that takes a constant and returns a type. Types are either going to be base types, they're going to be arrows, or they're going to be variables. Notice that we're not going to include for all. Uh, we're not going to include polymorphic types directly. We'll, I'll talk about that later. All right. So we have E, V, delta T, and then our set of constraints, we'll call that chi, and chi will be T equals t. Actually, let's, uh, let's clean this up a little bit. It'll either be empty or one set of constraints plus one that says t equals t. All right. And our type judgments are always of the form. Um, oh, we have to have one more thing. Gamma is going to... Um, do I need gamma? Yeah, I don't think I need gamma. Yeah, I don't think I need gamma. Um, Let's uh, let's say that um, let's say that uh, x bar is a set of variables, though. So our type judgments are of the form x bar proves that E has type T, has constraints x, and mentions the variables x. All right. So now let's write down our rules. So you refer back to this page. So our rules are the following. The first one says that if you're in, hmm, let's just call this thing gamma, um, just because it's convenient. All right. So oh, gross. Forgot a line. Okay. So if we look at gamma and we're given some constant b, then we're going to say that it's going to return big delta b as its type. It's going to have no constraints, and it's going to have um, no variables that it uses. This is kind of the boring case. 
All right, the next one is going to say that if we have gamma and some variable x, then its type is going to be x. Oh yeah, okay, sorry. I realized something. We do want gamma. Let me clean this up. Okay, we do want gamma. So gamma is either going to be empty or it's going to be a gamma where some variable lowercase x is mapped. It has some type t. That's a gamma right there. Okay. All right. Then in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to say that its type is gamma of x and there are no constraints and there are no variables. Okay. All right, so we've done variables, we've done, sorry, we've done constant, we've done variables, now let's do lambdas. So actually, uh, let's do functions first. It's function applications. So if we have a function application where we have um, f applied to a, then what are we going to say? Well, we're gonna use gamma and say that f had better have some type, which we'll call um, t f. And then it has some set of constraints, ek, uh, chi f, and then some set of variables, v f. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that gamma has to prove that a has some type ta, some set of constraints chi a, and then some set of variables va. All right. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that the type of fa is t range, and then the set of constraints are gonna be chi f unioned with chi a unioned with a new constraint that's going to say that tf had better equal ta arrow tr. And then the variables are going to be the variables from f unioned with the variables from a unioned with the set containing just tr because that's a new variable that we just made up. Okay, so notice that we just run the type system on f and we get back some type. We don't know what it is. We can't necessarily say it's going to be an arrow because it might be some variable. All right. Next, let's look at the rule for um, if statements. Actually, let's, let me move these things up. Okay. Let's look at the rule for if statements. It's going to say that gamma is going to prove that if e condition, e true, e false, its type is going to be, well first we're gonna check that gamma proves that ec has type tc, constraints chi c, variables c. Gamma proves that et has type tt, constraints chi t, variables vt, and keep going, gamma is going to prove that ef has type tf, constraints chi f, and variables vf. Now, what's the result type going to be? The result type is going to be tt, whatever that was, and the constraints are going to be chi c, unioned chi t, unioned chi f, unioned with two more constraints. These more constraints are gonna say that TC had better equal bool and TT had better equal TF. And then there are no new variables, so we have VC union VT union VF. Notice that what we're doing is we're just taking whatever types these happen to be and we're saying that the condition had better be a bool and true and false had better equal each other. All right, now for the last rule for lambdas. Lambdas are gonna say that gamma is going to prove that lambda x e has some type. Now what type does it have? We're gonna say that its type is 
td arrow tr, where we extend gamma with a mapping from x to td. And then we're going to type check e, and we're going to get back, whoops, we're going to get back tr, we're going to get back chi r and vr. All right. And then our constraints are just going to be chi r and vr with one new variable, td. So actually, let's name this big xd, just to make clear that it's a variable, not a type. All right, so the idea here is that whenever we have a lambda, we introduce a new variable to, to stand in for whatever its uh, argument is. Then if we ever look at that variable in the program, we get out that new type variable. So let's look at a little example program. 26, 8. So here's what our, our program is going to use all the features. So let's think of a good example. All right, so here's what we'll do. We'll do lambda x, all right? And lambda x is going to, the body of the, the code is going to be calling the function negate, which we're going to assume is a primitive, on x. And then the argument we're going to provide is an if statement that's going to say if true 5 otherwise uh, 6. Okay. So what I like to do when we're doing um, type checking of uh, when we're doing type inference on programs like this, I like to I like to draw them uh, as a tree. So this whole program is an application, which we'll write as an at, where the function is a lambda, that's lambda x, and its body is a negate, sorry, is another application, is another application where the function is negate and the argument is x. Then the argument is an if statement where there's a true, a five, and a six. So this right here is what we've been given. So let's just label all the nodes. So we'll have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. So now, Let's walk through what happens when we call the type checker on each of these things. Okay, so we're going to start off with gamma being empty, and we're calling it on the entire program A. Well, that's an application, so that means that we're going to use this rule right here. Okay? So that means, actually, let's not even, let's, yeah, okay, well, we'll do that. So what that means, is that we're then going to call it on B and on F. Now, I don't think writing that's very useful. So what A is going to do, we're, what we're just going to do is we're going to write down what constraints get generated from each, each thing. So A is going to generate the constraint that TF has to equal TATR. So TF is the one for the function. So we're going to say that the type variable b for that thing has to equal f arrow a. That's what we got by looking at expression a. That's the, that's the formula that we got. Now what happens when we look at expression b? Well, expression b is a lambda. Lambda. So that means it's going to return the type xdtr. Okay. So that means it's going to say that f, its type, is whatever x is, and it's going to return whatever c is. All right, now let's look at expression c. What happens there? Well, it's an application, so that means that it's going to generate the rule d equals e arrow c, because this is an application, so the function must take the argument and produce the answer. Now, what does D do? Well, D says that negate 
So D says that negate is a number arrow number function, because we know that from looking at delta. Now what does E say? E says that the E expression, its type is just x, because that's because we look up x and we see, aha, it's x. All right, now let's go look at what f ha what we see with f. So we look at expression f, the constraints that get generated are first that g must equal bool and that h has to equal i and that f has to equal h. Then when we go look at g, we're going to generate the formula g equals bool. When we look at h, we're going to get the formula h equals number. And when we see i, we're going to get the formula i equals number. All right? So this simple program right here generates 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 constraints. All right. Now what we have to do is, is show how to solve these constraints. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy them onto the next page, just the constraints. Well, let's see. Copy, go to the next page. Let's paste them in. Let's write down where we are. We're on 26.9, 26.9, and then let me just do a little bit more moving things around. Okay, so we'll move that over here, and then we'll get this. All right, then we'll erase this and erase that. All right, okay, so this right here is a set of constraints that we generated from this program. The way that this is going to work, and by the way, we know that the final answer is A. We want to know what type A is. Oh, whoops. Uh, sorry. Right here. Right here, I wrote, oh, you want mechanical pencil. Right here, I wrote F, but I meant to write B. That was a mistake. So let's go fix that right here. This is supposed to be a B. All right. All right, so here's the way that this is going to work. We're going to look at each rule one at a time, and then we're going to make changes to each one to all the other rules based on what it says. So we're going to look at this rule right here. We're, sorry, we're going to look at this constraint. And because we're looking at that constraint, it says B equals F arrow A. So what we're going to do is we're going to go find all the Bs in the program and in the constraints and replace them with F arrow A. So we're going to get F equals, sorry, F arrow A equals X arrow C. So we're going to replace this rule, we're going to place that constraint, and we're going to change it into that. Now we're going to look through and there's no more Bs, so we're done. The next thing that we're going to do, and let me just move this over a little bit so we have more space. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to see, aha, this says F arrow A equals X arrow C. So we're going to get rid of this, and then we're going to get the new rule that's going to say F equals X and the constraint that A equals C. And the reason we're going to get that is because these two arrows must mean that things match. So then what's going to happen You know what, I kind of feel like I shouldn't have put lines through these. Instead what I'm going to do says F arrow A equals X arrow C. I'm going to put these two lines right here. I'm going to say what it gets turned into. And it's going to be more clear. So this one says B equals X arrow C. Alright, so now I have, now I have the rule F equals X and A equals C. 
So we're going to look at that first one, and we're going to go and find all the f's and change them to x. So we're going to change this one right here into b equals x arrow a. Notice that we go back to earlier rules that have f's and get rid of them. Then we're going to go down here and look for more f's. Aha, here's one. So we'll change that to x equals h. And then we're done with that. Then we're going to look at this one that says a equals c. And we're going to go find all the a's and replace them with c. So that means we're going to change this one right here. And it's going to say b is now equal to x arrow c. And we're going to find any more a's. Nope, no more a's. So then we're done with this. Now we'll move to this one, which says d equals e arrow c. So we're going to change this one down here. So it's going to say e arrow c equals num arrow num. Then we're going to split that up into two. It says e equals num and c equals num. So then we're going to look at this e and say, aha, it says e equals num. So then we're going to go find all the e's and change them to num. So this one's going to say num equals x. No more e's down here. Then we look, up, we look up and make sure there's none. Uh huh. There's one that says d equals e arrow c. So we're going to change that to d equals num arrow c. And realize that we're going to have to move this. Okay. Then we see this one that says c equals num. So we're going to change all the c's to num. So we'll change this up here to b equals x arrow num. And this says this is going to change to a equals num. And this one's going to change to d equals num arrow num. Any more c's? There aren't. So right now our equations are b equals x arrow num, f equals x, a equals number, d equals number arrow number, e equals number, c equals number. Now here we have one that says num equals x. So we're going to change this to x equals number. Then, now that it's of the form variable equals base, we're going to go find all the x's and replace them with num. So that means that now we know that b equals number arrow number. We're going to change this one to f equals number. a equals number. Okay, any more x's? Here's an x, so we're going to change this to number equals h. Okay. So now we're going to go down here and it says g equals bool. So we're going to find all the g's and replace them with bool. So that means that we're going to go down here and this is going to turn into bool equals bool. Sorry, bool, bool equals bool. Then we see h equals i. So what we're going to do there is we're going to find all the h's and change them to i. So this says number equals i. And here's another one. This one's going to say i equals number. Okay, this next one says number equals i, so we'll flip that so it's i equals number. Then we're going to find all the i's and replace them with number. So that one's going to change this to h equals number. Here we're going to change this to number equals number. And we're going to change this to number equals number. All right, then we're going to go here that says bool equals bool, so we're going to get rid of that and turn it into nothing. Then we see number equals number, we're going to get rid of that and turn it into nothing. And this says number equals number, so we're going to get rid of that and turn it into nothing. Now we got to the bottom, and so now let's see what is written on the far edge of everything. So we learned that b equals number, arrow number. We learned that f equals number. That's that one. We learned that a equals number. Um, hold on. I'm trying to squeeze things in here. We learned that b equals number our number, f equals number. We learned that a equals number from right there. We learned that d equals number our number. We learned that e 
equals number, that c equals number, that x equals number, that g equals bool, that h equals number, and that i is equal to number. So these equations down here are all of the expressions in our program, a through i, and each one is set equal to some particular type. And notice that we discovered two things. We discovered what the type of the whole program is, a is a number, and we discovered what the type of that variable was, which was number. So x is number. So notice that this system of equations, we could, we could mechanically solve it and derive a solution to the types of everything in the program. Let's write down the actual algorithm for what we did. This algorithm is called solve. And what it does is it takes a set of constraints and another set of constraints and returns a set of constraints. These constraints are called a substitution, and they are always of the form x equals a base type. Sorry. They're always of the form x equals a type. Uh, actually, uh, I can't really explain in a succinct way what the difference is. The basic idea is that these constraints um, always say a variable equals something, and the variable that's on the left never appears on the right. And these constraints right here are the same kind that gets returned. So if we call solve, and we give it a substitution, that's what we're going to call this thing, and we give it the empty set of constraints, then we're just going to return the substitution. That's kind of the bore most boring case. If we call solve, and we get a substitution, and then the first constraint is of the form t equals t, i.e. where they're literally exactly the same thing, and then there's some more constraints, then we're just going to ignore that one. So that's like when we saw these down here where it said number equals number. Okay, the next thing is what happens if the first constraint is of the form x equals t. Then in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to call solve on subst prime and cs prime, where subst prime is equal to x equals t put on top of subst where we find all of the x's and replace them with t. And cs prime is equal to cs, where we find all the x's and we replace them with t. So that's what we did every time we discovered something like x equals number. We went and found all the x's and replaced them with number. And we did that in the substitution, which was the stuff above, and in the constraint, which was the stuff below where we were looking. Okay, next, if we are call solve, and we're given t equals x, then we'll just flip them. So we'll call solve on subst with x equals t, and then the constraints. That way we just have to, don't have to copy that twice. The next rule is going to say if we call solve on subst, and we get a arrow b equals p arrow q, then what we'll do is we'll call solve on the substitution with a equals p and then b equals q and then the other constraints. And these are the rules that we use the entire time. We use no other rules than this. Now what we do then is we start off by calling solve with an empty set of substitutions, and then the constraints from the entire program. And then that's going to return 
uh, answer substitution, and then we take the final type, t, and we look it up inside of there. So for instance, if we call with the empty environment an expression, and we get back t, chi, and v, then what we're going to do, so given that, what we'll do is we'll call solve with empty and that set of constraints, and it returns the substitution. We take that substitution and we look up inside of it the t, and we see what type it is. Then now we know that the what the final type of the program is. This is a very simple set of equations um, that, uh, that, that can really solve any system of constraints uh, in our language. Now, there are a few interesting things. The first thing is, what about ill-typed programs? Programs with no type. So for example, suppose we were given the program negate false. Well, what's going to happen there is that we're going to generate the constraints that b has to equal a function, so this whole thing is a, that's b, that's c, a function, sorry, yeah, that b has to be a function, oh, gross, has to be a function that goes from c to a, that b is a function that goes from number to number, and c is a bool, sorry, is a bool. This is num, num. OK. Well, what we're going to discover then is that, yeah, let's just run it. So this set of constraints will turn into um, c arrow a has to equal number arrow number. And that means that we're going to get c has to equal number and a has to equal number. So then we're going to get the constraint that number has to equal bool. And number equal bool is not one of our cases here. It's not t equals t. It's not a variable equals a type. It's not a type equals a variable. It's not an arrow equals another, another arrow. So therefore, this there's no answer, and then it errors. Okay. So we get an unsolvable, unsolvable equation. So that's what happens when a program has no type. What about what about polymorphism? So notice that if I write a function like this, lambda x x five, then it's going to work out just fine. It's going to it's going to say that sorry, it's going to say that the whole type of the program is number because I don't need to put an annotation on this. See, because what's going to happen is, is that what we're going to say, so remember this whole program is A, then we get B, then we get C, then we get D. So we're going to get that B has to be a function that goes from D to A. We're going to learn that B has to be a function that goes from X to C. And we're going to see that c has to be equal to x, and that d has to be equal to number. All right? So when we add all these things together, we're going to see that d has to be number, c has to be x, d has to be x, therefore d and x also have to be number. So that means that b has to be number, arrow, number, so that's this function that c is equal to number, that d is equal to number, and that a is equal to number. So this, exp this term, which is polymorphic, just works out fine. And that same term could be applied in different contexts. So we could write if lambda x x true, lambda x x 5 and 6. This program is totally fine because that term can get one type in one situation and one type in another situation. Another interesting thing, though, 
is that what happens when we run on a polymorphic program that's not applied to anything? What happens there? So let's label this program A and that inner thing B. So what we're going to determine is, is that A goes from X to B, and B is equal to X. So therefore, our final thing is going to be that A is a function from X to X, and B is an X. And notice that X doesn't say what it is, so therefore it could be anything. So if a variable never is discovered to be equal to anything, then that's what polymorphism is. Now, there's kind of a weird situation, though, with polymorphism. And that's that, what if I write this program? Let id equal lambda xx in if id true, id 5, 6. What happens here? Well, what we're going to find out is that because we use exactly the same thing right here, exactly the same name, this block of code is going to say that id has to have the type bool arrow bool, and this part down here is going to say that id has to have the type number arrow number, and so we're going to mix those together, and we're going to say that there's a type error. Because the problem is that we are not discovering what the polymorphism should have been applied here, i.e. we're not inserting a big lambda in this situation and then inserting what the instantiation should be. We can discover polymorphism, but we can't discover and apply it. So that's problematic. The way that this is done in practice is with something called let polymorphism. And let polymorphism works like this. We add a new rule to the type system. And it's going to say that gamma proves that let x equals e in, we'll call this ex, in eb. What it does is we're going to, we're going to say that gamma has to prove that eb if we found all the x's and we replaced them with ex, it would have type t with constraints chi and variables v. Notice that what we're doing here is that when we have a let, we imagine that we substituted the value into each place. This is only in the type system. It's not in the running of the program. In the running of the program, we really turn this thing into a value. Um, but in the type system, we duplicate the code. And by duplicating the code in each one of these places, we can make it so that this application of id has the type bool bool, and this one has the type number number. One consequence of let polymorphism is the so-called value restriction, restriction of ML. And I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but basically this let can only be used if this thing right here, ex, is a value, meaning it's a number or a constant or a lambda or something like that. It can't be a complicated expression. If it's a complicated expression, then we have been able to discover violations of type soundness. And so let polymorphism exposes the power of polymorphism, but only in a limited way to deal with the, let, with the value restriction. All right. The next little tidbit about type inference that I want to talk about is performance. So the algorithm that I've talked about the type checking, so the type checking is made up of two parts. It's made up of constraint generation, and then after constraint generation, there's constraint solving. Now, constraint generation is essentially an ON operation. It's not exactly ON, because notice with the let polymorphism, we duplicate the code. And then constraint solving is cubic. So that means that the whole thing is cubic for the language that I've described. Now, there are more complicated languages that we could try to do type inference for, and there are some languages that we've been able to show that type inference for them is not only not 
quad not cubic, but we can actually show that it's exponential, and we can show that it's that for some it's in fact undecidable. We can't do type inference for them. So type inference is essentially a very expensive process. This is one of the reasons why in C++, when you use the auto, it only works within a function. This is why in Haskell, um, you can only do type inference within, the, within a single function definition. Because it's very expensive, we don't want to expose it to the entire program. And in fact, with Haskell, if you try to do type inference across the entire program, it's one of these languages that would be, um, uh, would be exponential or undecided, I forget which, um, for. So the performance uh, can be pretty troubling. Now, there's one more instance of performance that's relevant, which is that what if we tried to do type inference on this expression right here? Lambda x, x applied to x. So let's do a little diagram of this. So we have the entire program A, and A is a lambda, which is a lambda x, and it points to an at, which is applying x and x. So we'll call this B, this C, and this D. Okay. So A is, has to be a function that goes from x to b. b tells us that c has to be a function that goes from a d to a b. And then c has to be equal to x, and d has to be equal to x. So if we substitute these everywhere, we'll see that x has to equal x arrow b, and a has to equal x arrow b, and c equals x, and d equals x. Now notice that if we were to use our formula from before, we would see that it says, aha, x goes to x arrow b. Well, then what we would do is we would find all the x's in the program and replace them with x arrow b. So this x arrow b would become x arrow b arrow b, and this would become x arrow b, and this would become x arrow b. This equation right here violates an assumption of our algorithm. And that's that when we do a substitution, when we discover that x equals some type, we have removed that type from the program, sorry, that variable from the program. But this, break, this equation breaks it because t this thing on the right hand side, x occurs inside of it. So what we need to do is we need to go back into our program, into our solver, and add a constraint right here where it says where x is not inside of t. So we have to look inside of t and make sure that it's not inside of there. And if it is inside of there, then we error and we say this program uses an infinite type and that doesn't make sense. This is called the occurs check. Occurs check. There are some um, type inference systems that become very expensive when you enable the occurs check, and you can turn it off. You can say, don't use the occurs check in my program. And that makes it so that type inference can be faster, but it can also use arbitrary memory and take infinite time. So it's dangerous to turn it off. All right, uh, that is a good summary of type inference. And I think that's where we'll end for today.